Well, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your day to, to join us for this conversation. Um, I'm very happy to be joined by uh, Dr. Timothy Versteinen, uh, co-director of the CMU Pitt Brain Imaging Data Generation and Education Center, or BRIDGE for short. Uh, Tim is, a, is an associate professor in psychology, neuroscience, and biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Tim has been using MRI as a research tool since 2001 to understand the neural mechanisms of action, selection, and control. In 2018, Tim helped found the CMU Pitt uh, Bridge Center, uh, which is a data-forward neuroimaging research center focused on facilitating the application of cutting-edge machine learning and data science tools to the study of the living brain. So to our knowledge, and the reason why we're here today is because the Bridge Center uh, is the first center to standardize, kind of center-wide, um, on the BIDS format, on the BIDS data standard, from data acquisition all the way through to analysis uh, and ultimately export. So I'm very happy to be joined with Tim today. He's going to actually share a little bit about the center and talk about how the, how the center went through the process of standardizing uh, on BIDS with Flywheel. Um, so I should also introduce myself. I am Michael Perry. Uh, I am the Vice President of Scientific and Customer Solutions at Flywheel. And today's agenda, what we're gonna start with actually, is I'm gonna take you through just a little bit about Flywheel um, and talk about how Flywheel supports bids uh, in the platform itself. So we're gonna take about 10 or so minutes to do that, go over a few things there, uh, touch on the functionality. And then I'm gonna turn things over to, to Tim and he's gonna talk uh, a little bit more about you know, the Bridge Center and their experience with bids and Flywheel. And then we're gonna bring it back for a little bit of a uh, Q&A session at the end here. So let's get right into it. Flywheel, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, is a data management and collaboration platform. And the focus of Flywheel is really to increase productivity, collaboration, and reproducibility in biomedical research. Um, and we do this in a number of ways, um, but mainly by offering tools that help researchers get their research done. Um, so we have tools that allow you to capture data, in some cases, automatically, as uh, Tim will probably talk about here in the Bridge Center case, directly from the instrument, bring those data into Flywheel, where we offer further tools to allow you to automate the curation uh, of the data once they come in. So you can run things like you know, uh, QC algorithms, you can annotate images, you can get your data into bids format so they can easily be shared with collaborators. Um, and of course, you can compute on those data within the platform. Uh, we have a full scalable platform for uh, computational uh, purposes. We have automated pipelines, we support machine learning, and we have open APIs and SDKs that allow you to actually build on top of the platform um, to do whatever bespoke research you need to do. And of course, there's full provenance tracking. So anything that happens to your data within the platform, you have a record of that. Um, and then finally, one of the main goals here is to actually drive collaboration. Um, and we have a number of tools that allow you to do this. We have a very uh, comprehensive support for privacy and security protocols, including secure sharing, uh, GDPR and HIPAA compliance, as well as 21 CFR part 11 support. So now focusing on bids, uh, which is one of the themes here of this talk is that we wanna actually support the way that researchers want to use their data. Uh, and one of the ways that we do this is by supporting the brain imaging data structure. Um, so, and this is BIDS, so what is it actually? So BIDS is really a standard for organizing and describing data on disk. Um, and the main purpose for this is so that, you know, other users and programs can know what to expect of the data. They can make certain assumptions about the data and they can know where to look a priori for certain information. Um, as, you know, those of you watching this are probably very familiar with, you know, many different researchers have many different ways of organizing data um, and lacking a standard that makes it very difficult to collaborate uh, and compare and share algorithms. So this standard is really meant to kind of take a step towards that. There are also data analysis software packages uh, referred to generally as BIDS apps uh, that actually understand the data that are organized this way. So they can make certain assumptions about the structure of the data. And as I was mentioning, they know where to go grab certain parameters from your data and they know what to do with them. Um, so it's a way to kind of speak one language across different disparate applications for analysis. Um, 
And generally, why would you want to do this, uh, kind of beyond the reasons that we just mentioned, um, is because this really is a way to foster collaboration and sharing of data. And there are certain um, repositories that actually automatically support uh, the import and export of BIDS data sets, Open Neuro being one of those. And then of course, if you wanted to publicly share your data, which you know, as you're all aware, I'm sure some journals are now requiring, um, this process can be sped up by using a standard like BIDS uh, because you can actually use tooling that's already been provided that's open source, um, that's kind of continuously growing and getting better uh, to be able to describe your data and provide them to, to these data repositories or journals so they can access them. Uh, and what does it look like? So we're gonna take a, a couple of moments here to just kind of uh, conceptualize what it is for those of you not familiar with it. So essentially your data will start at kind of the quote unquote raw stage, uh, although it's not exactly raw, but kind of DICOM raw. Uh, and you will take those DICOM data and typically what you will do is you will convert those um, to a nifty format using a DCM to NIX, for example. Um, and from there, you can actually take your DICOM data and you can convert them into a data structure, um, really a folder hierarchy that looks like this on the right here, uh, where you have a project and you have a subject and each one of those subjects can have sessions. Um, and then within those sessions, you'll have the different acquisitions, um, which are referenced here by um, the, the type or the modality of the data. Um, so there are four main levels of bid structure. There's the project, subject, session, acquisition. Um, and as I mentioned here, with the exception of the top level project folder, all of the subfolders have a specific structure to their name. Um, and this is really just to say that all of the information that bids requires um, is generally in file names and in supplementary, what they call sidecar files. Um, so this is an example of that structure here. So we can see data set 01 has a description up here at the top. And this is just a JSON file that describes the data set. So it has information about the, the bid specification version that this data set adheres to, the name of the data, who are the authors, um, information about how to acknowledge these, uh, that how to acknowledge this data set if you use it in um, further research, um, information about funding and so on. And then you have information about the participants here. Um, and this is a TSV file that's provided that has information about uh, demographic information essentially about your participants. Um, and then you get into, as we were talking about in the previous slide, kind of the core of it where the data live. Um, and that gets into your, your subject level um, and into your sessions and into your, your acquisitions. Um, and then of course you can have supplemental um, files describing your task if you're doing fMRI for example. Um, and these are typically in JSON format and they'll have information actually about the uh, about the task or they'll have information about the actual um, data in there. So here you'll notice that we have like TR um, represented here as well. And that's important kind of going down um, further when you're talking about doing analyses and you actually want to start, um, you know, tailoring your analysis pipeline to actually fit the data. You'll need this type of information. So that's really all I was planning on covering with bids. There's a whole lot more uh, that you can learn about it. I, I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with it already, to, to go to uh, the bids website and look at the standard, try to familiarize yourself with it. Um, now we're going to focus on bids and flywheel. So what about bids and flywheel? What does flywheel kind of bring to the table for bids? How does it support it? Um, and to illustrate that, I'm going to go through these five different things. Um, the import of data in the flywheel, curation of data, already in Flywheel. And then I'm gonna to touch on bids view in Flywheel, which is a different way of visualizing data than the typical Flywheel view. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about export. Uh, and then finally wrap it up with the discussion um, on bids gears and how we actually can convert uh, bids applications into Flywheel gears. So this here is an overview of the functionality in Flywheel. Um, so you can actually, if you have a pre-existing bids data set that you've already kind of hand curated, or maybe you've grabbed that from a place like Open Neuro, for example, um, or used a tool like Dataland to grab a, a previously bids curated data set, you can actually use the Flywheel CLI, the command line interface that Flywheel provides to import those data directly into Flywheel. Um, and once you do that, the data will land all of the metadata that are in those sidecar files, the participants file, 
um, the project description file, all of that will be parsed and brought into Flywheel as metadata. Um, and that's an important distinction that I'll touch on uh, again in just a couple of minutes. Um, and then the next bullet here, we can actually curate data that already exists in Flywheel. And once we do that, we actually have uh, access to this integrated bids view. What that allows you to do is actually take a look at your data as it would land if you were to export it, uh, which is another functionality available through our CLI. And then finally, our bids apps, uh, which we have as gears. Here's a few examples of those, uh, but I will touch on those uh, in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So first, the bids import functionality. Um, so here, as we talked about, if you wanted to import an existing bids curated data set using the CLI, it's really once you have that bids directory on disk, um, it's as simple as this command here, fw import bids. You can give it the location of your bids directory on disk, the destination for the group, inside a flywheel, and then up it goes. And there are a couple of command line options that you can use here to override defaults, um, but those are really just uh, details and, and use case dependent. Now the curation of the existing data, uh, and this is what we're, we're really gonna focus on, um, and Tim's gonna touch on this a little bit in his talk as well about this process and how you go through it in flywheel. Um, but really, the, the point that I want to make is that converting data to bids is difficult. And this is quoted because we've heard this from a number of different users. Doing this kind of on your own on disk is a difficult task. There's a lot of information that you need to pull out. It's very manual, um, and you need to be very you know, cognizant of your pathway. Um, and as I said, there are different tools that you can use to help uh, mitigate this process. Um, but really, it remains kind of an, an onerous task um, for for most users to, to try to achieve. Inside a flywheel, we kind of take a different view. Um, we, kind of, we view this as setting up curation, which is typically um, generating a template for curation. That does take effort. That takes some setup time, some investment. Um, but typically this, as we'll talk about, is done by you know, a couple of individuals that are familiar with the data coming uh, into the system. And once you have that, the actual curation of the data in Flywheel is very quick and it's quite easy. Um, and what actually is at the heart of this is what we call the curate bids gear. And this is actually what curates the data within Flywheel um, and adds metadata to those files to actually represent the bid structure. And this is an important point. So this curation process really only modifies metadata. So the actual data, the file names themselves and the raw data are unchanged, they're untouched. You actually don't need to worry about modifying anything there because everything that represents the bid structure is actually represented in metadata. And so how do we do this? We use a JSON template. Um, and this template is kept on the project. And this allows you to essentially map the data that are coming into Flywheel to the bids organization that you want. And this is a very flexible approach. This template can be modified, it can be extended, uh, which is a good thing because as I note here, the bid specification changes all the time. Um, it's continuously, as I was saying, it was growing. It's a, it's a very living thing. There are a number of researchers contributing extensions to the specification. Um, so it's very good to be, as we reference here, unbiased about the structure of the template so that we can extend it and we can support newer versions of the spec. Now, an important point here uh, is this last one that I make. So the data that conforms to a bids compliant acquisition naming standard, something like ReproInt, uh, which, is, which is what Tim is also gonna talk about being implemented at Bridge. Um, if you are able to do this, uh, you can actually, if you, and so just to touch on what ReproInt is, so it is a naming standard that you can actually implement at the scanner itself. So when you are configuring your protocol, you can actually use a naming convention um, defined by repro in. And if you do this inside a flywheel, you can also have a much quicker path to curation and quote unquote out of the box um, because we actually have a repro in template already ready to go that you can simply choose to use if you were collecting your data using this repro in naming standard at the scanner. Um, and again, you'll hear a little bit more about that from Tim uh, as this was the technique that's used uh, and implemented at Bridge today. And now, once data are curated, um, how is that represented in Flywheel? So on the left-hand side here, you can actually see 
This is the typical flywheel view of your data. Uh, so each one of these blocks is an acquisition. Within that acquisition, you have your raw DICOM data and you'll have your nifty file that was generated uh, by a tool like DCM to NIX, for example. Um, and that's the view that you get. But once you've actually run through curation, you will have the opportunity to toggle this little bids view switch, which is up here at the top, if you can see my cursor. And that will actually trigger the launch of this bids viewer. And when you have that uh, on, you'll actually see here laid out um, the, the data and how they will be named um, when they are exported or when they are provided to a gear to be executed uh, against. So you can see we have a NAT, we have FMAP, and we have functional here. Those are all the different directories. And you can see how you know the subject identifier, the session identifier, and the modality is all captured in the file name as you would expect. Uh, in addition to this, uh, I don't have a, a screen cap showing this, but you also have the participants file and you have a data set description that can actually be modified in real time uh, at the project level within Flywheel. And then of course, with your exported data in Flywheel, um, you can export those data. Um, and it's very similar to what you, what you saw with the import. It's kind of the uh, inverse of that. You can say Flywheel export bids and you can give it a project name and then a destination on disk. And those data will be exported from Flywheel, downloaded to your local disk. Um, and you can actually have those data there, fully bids compliant uh, and local. So you can work with them. You can run algorithms on those locally. Um, or you can share them, upload them to um, another data repository, whatever the needs might be. Uh, and lastly, uh, and this is kind of the most exciting part, I know from speaking to a number of our users, what they really want to do is take advantage of the, of the wonderful Bids app library um, that's available. So a number of researchers have kind of standardized or beginning to standardize uh, on bids for their analysis pipelines. So there are, a whole host of these available. This is just a subset of some of those which we have taken from their bids app state and converted to a flywheel gear, um, which is a, a very quick and, and somewhat painless process. Um, we actually have this repository here that I highlight at the bottom, uh, this bids app template repository, which actually provides you with a Python template for building gears that were um, that were meant to run on bids formatted data. So. If you're interested in, in converting your own bids application or one of your favorites to a flywheel gear, uh, you can look here for more information about how to do that. Um, as I said previously, one of the great things about these pipelines and being bids compliant, these pipelines, um, is that they, they all work on data kind of in the same way, structured the same way. So it allows you to, to start your analysis from a very common uh, point. Um, so you know how you know, metadata are structured and you know how the data are structured and you can share those data around in that format without having to provide them to a collaborator and you know reformat them or reconvert them um, or try to parse out metadata in a different way. So all these applications work within Flywheel on bids curated data sets. They actually will export the data to the gear at runtime and run just as if it were running uh, on a local resource with of course the benefit of the scalability uh, that Flywheel provides. There, and as I said, this is just a subset of some of the gears that we have presently. There are more to come. Our team is continuously working um, on these and other projects. Uh, and we're very excited to, to support these applications in Flywheel. Okay, and that's, that's it for the Flywheel Bids overview. Um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Tim. And he's gonna talk a little bit more about the use case uh, at the Bridge Center and their experience with standardizing on bids with Flywheel. Sure. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, I think you've done a good job of explaining what bids is, and I'd like to kind of spend some time showing why. Why do we care? So the logic I'm going to lay out here is to explain why bids in a in a in a framework from the point of view of an applied image or people kind of working in the the trenches, if you will. So. Uh, as Michael mentioned, at the Bridge Center, which I'm a co-director with, along with Julie Fees over at the University of Pittsburgh, we are a data-focused imaging center that's, that really is, is bedrocked in the principles of what's known as open science. Uh, so we, we really want to adopt open science principles as, as part of the foundation of the imaging center. 
So the Bridge Center itself has a few core principles that kind of guide how we think about uh, what we do. Uh, we think that an imaging center is both a research tool and an educational tool. So along with providing research output, an imaging center should itself also provide education and growth of its user community. Uh, an imaging center should strive to remove barriers to access. So as much as possible, the imaging center should do what it can to increase access to both acquisition of data and analysis. Uh, an imaging center serves as a research community hub, which again, with something like Flywheel, where most of the centralized processes are, are, are located in the same instance of the cloud, all users are going to the same place. It helps to build that, that community hub. Uh, and an imaging center should foster innovation. Uh, we, you know, we have working tools that have worked great in the past, but we should always be looking forward. And the Bridge Center itself uh, is a strictly research MRI center. So we currently have a 3T Siemens Prisma system uh, where we can run high resolution uh, images using things like multiband technology to have high spatial and temporal resolution, so human connect them, project compliant imaging protocols. Right now, we have about two dozen active research labs across the two universities. Uh, we, are, we are slowly expanding our hours of use as we get more and more demand. Uh, and the research being conducted at the, at the Bridge Center is, is spans a, a, whole, a whole range of topics from cortical reorganization after surgical resection, uh, research looking at health brain associations, so exercise changes the brain, how the brain might be a predictor of cardiovascular disease, basic science research on brain development, both in children and adolescents, uh, research on the impact of mindfulness in the brain, uh, and growing work on brain artificial intelligence integration. So how can you integrate neural signals as a, as a tool for which artificial intelligence agents can use to, to better interact with humans? So it goes all over the place here. This gives us, uh, as directors, a quite demanding set of, of resources we have to put together in order to support this breadth of research. And that's where I think BIDS comes into play here, is that if we want to have these disparate researchers collaborate and build a community, we need to have a way for them to easily share either data or data analytics. And I like to kind of present this by analogy. Let's say that I've got two users at the imaging center. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jane here who uh, goes to the center. She typically collects raw data. And in a standard use case, usually what happens is she'll build a pipeline, let's say using SPM and FreeSurfer, has some core MATLAB functions that she put together, has her own QC pipeline, and she has her kind of custom data architecture, file naming conventions, folder naming conventions. John down the hall does the same thing. He goes to the center, he collects his data, and he might use things like FSL and FreeSurfer, might use the ACP workbench, rely on MRI QC, and rely on the BITS architecture. So if John wants to share with Jane, there needs to be a translation function. He needs to be able to translate his data architecture and his analysis pipelines to something that Jane's lab can use. And the same is true for Jane. She needs to produce the inverse translation function. So every time you want to build a research collaboration, there needs to be this, this translation of, of data architectures and file naming conventions, making sure that local software is set up correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So this produces a barrier for collaboration within a community and also across imaging center communities in general. And this barrier starts with the typical way we think about data access at the point of acquisition. So your typical imaging center data acquisition and data access looks kind of like this. You'll have your raw data um, that gets collected in the file system. There's some re reconstruction going on at the console and it might get pushed to some external server that has a, you know, a DICOM converter and a DICOM sorter that just sits as a set of sorted data files on some computer server. Uh, and just to kind of give you an example of what this looks like. So this, if you can see uh, my screen here, this is kind of an example output of our old file server that we were using pre flywheel You would just get sort of DICOMs. You would have each run have a separate folder, one through, in this case, 19. And if you look in a folder, you would just have these sort of DICOMs. It's clean, it's simple. And then the reliance on the users to scrape their data, 
reconstruct it in say nifty formats and then if they wanted to use bids reconstruct it in their own bids format using their own in-house tools that put a lot of effort on the users now with flywheel what we do is we take the repro in logic and hold that constant in our file naming conventions on the console so as a center every research study that we set up has to be repro in compliant so we set it up on the console that we have our labs dr v dr b dr e dr bids every uh project has its own custom name and then we start sorting different sessions according to these different exams which has the queue of sequences that will be run for that project and those sequences follow the repro in naming convention or approximately so we had to make some changes to kind of adapt here but uh, importantly every session that's run at the center follows the standard so every every collection of data that happens at the center is is consistent with the same template so with the flywheel connector now what we can do is we can have the live scraping of data off of the console as it gets written gets pushed up to our cloud where there is the automatic MRI QC that gets run, and we also have access, a semi-automated access to that bits curation tool that uses the repro in template. So from a user's perspective, their data gets pushed up. When they go to Flywheel to get their data, they hit the bits curation uh, gear, and they automatically now have compliant bids checked data. And what that essentially does is it breaks that barrier now between Jane and John. Right? They both might be collecting different data using different data analysis tools, but in the end, it's all gonna be bids compliant. So they'll get their data in, in a bid standard, they'll have their QC reports, they have minimal pre-processing. So for example, we also support at the Imaging Center standard use of things like fMRI prep, so they can uh, pre-process their data in the same way. And so now if you wanna have sharing between these two labs, there's no more barrier. It's bids compliant data using bids apps. And so these users can share and they can share more easily. And so that's the fundamental principle of why we are adopting as a center standard, the bids format. And we've done a lot over the last couple of years working uh, with Flywheel to kind of adjust our process. And they've been very patient with us. Uh, and so far we've had uh, semi-automatic bits conversion, quality checks, support for tools for uh, running data analysis at the point of data access, mechanisms for internal and external data sharing are already built in. We're currently working on uh, the educational part as well, which is going to use Flywheel and currently using Flywheel as an integral part, uh, multi-level user training programs in the center, formal classes, which we use open neuro and data collect at the center as applied workshops for working with neuroimaging data. Um, and you know we're sponsoring hackathons. We helped sponsor a hackathon this last winter, uh, and in part, being able to have data in bids standard allowed for us to really kind of contribute to that hackathon. So, from the imaging center perspective, we've kind of solved, I think, or at least we're working towards solving a key dilemma: How do you adapt to the exponentially increasing size and complexity of our data? The data analysis size, of the data formats themselves. You have to build a stronger, more effective research community. And it, you do that by adopting and fostering open science data practices, but critically at the point of data access itself, at the imaging center itself, by providing users with open science compliant data, it allows for them to have less effort to engage in those practices themselves in their labs and allows for greater sharing. So this is, this is why we as a center have just kind of jumped all in on bids as a data analysis tool. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was great. And uh, we can chat a little bit. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you about uh, your experience there. And I think the first one is um, maybe if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what was, what, if any, were the, were the challenges that you faced in kind of setting up the, uh, the protocols there at the center? I imagine this may have been new for a lot of users. Maybe some users didn't, uh, I see the vision there at the beginning. What, what was that experience like? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say our biggest, I wouldn't call them barriers, but our biggest challenges to this process is are, are cultural. Um, so, okay. you know, especially since we, 
we took over from a set of other imaging centers. Essentially, the Bridge Center is the combination or union of two previous iterations of imaging centers at either university. And so, uh, you know, we have a history of practices in terms of how people get their data, how people name their, their files, how people think about what their data architectures are. And so every lab is their own little fiefdom, right? And so every lab has their own pipelines and disrupting something as simple as file naming and file architectures at the point of data access uh, is, is, a, is a challenging mental hurdle. I mean, to change over pipelines to be, you know, uh, accessible to bids data or to be applied to bids data is actually not a big effort, but it seems like a big effort, right? Um, other challenges we had are, you know, we have many groups that do multi-site randomized clinical trials. And so if they're trying to integrate data across different sites, a lot of times they will have built a standardized data architecture, a file naming architecture for, you know, the different sites, usually kind of using different tools for, for converting their data. And so us forcing a different standard at first uh, seemed to be a, a, you know, a challenge, but over time as, as more of our groups adopt bids, that's actually become easier of a sell for groups doing randomized clinical trials across sites, because you know, if all the data is in bids format, there's no customized conversion across site for the labs that are running these protocols. So what started as kind of a challenge to us ended up actually being a selling point for many of these groups. So I would say that's the biggest challenge or biggest hurdle so far. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and can you talk maybe a little bit about the, the time savings that you've seen, um, if any users have come to you, or maybe you have from your own personal experience, um, kind of doing the hand bids curation, if you will, uh, locally on disk versus their kind of experience with flight by flywheel or maybe even your own um, and having that curated workflow in flywheel kind of what are the differences in kind of time and effort there yeah I, I can say that the the desire to have the data be immediately bids compliant at the point you take it off the center really just stemmed from my own frustrations and my own labs frustrations <laughs> from having to sure you know, curate our own data set to be bids compliance. I mean, I think everybody who's tried to work with bids knows that fight with the bids validator. Uh, you yes. know, you think your data is great. You think you're, you, it's all there. You run it to the bids validator and you get a bunch of red flags and then you have to fight it. And every time you think you've got it working for one experiment, you collect a different experiment. You maybe add in a new imaging sequence. Maybe you do add in a diffusion imaging sequence or, a, you know, a, a different type of field map. And then suddenly it all falls apart again. And you have to spend yep. time every time you're setting up an experiment tweaking your your you know your bids template to get it to work and so i was seeing you know students and, and postdocs lose a lot of time just fighting getting their data into a bids format first and what ended up happening was a lot of students would write their own analysis pipelines analyze their data and then when it got to be time to post the data on something like open neuro would go back make their data bids compliant because they had to, and then post yeah. it up that way. And so a lot of times it was pushing the bids conversion to the end and people thought it was an afterthought when they had to share their data instead of the first thing they needed to do for their data. So putting it this way where you have it at the point of data access really just, just kind of cuts off that time of fighting with your data in order to get it to be in this manner. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fantastic point. Um, and I can I can definitely relate to that. I know several individuals who have kind of gone through the same process where they say, okay, I've, I've gone through my research project, I've analyzed my data now, you know, the journal wants it, or I want to be able to, you know, share it, publish it somewhere else. Now I have to go through that compliance and, you know, they find, oh, maybe I need to reconvert my data <laughs> to, to nifty format and because I need to generate the sidecars and I need to do all of these things. And like you're saying, the benefit of having all of that done up front and doing it the way that you're doing it, which in, in my opinion is is the right way to do it, the only way to do it uh, by standardizing kind of the naming convention at the console and getting the data before they come in to bids um, is is tremendous, or sorry, into flywheel is tremendous. Um, it really allows you to kind of automate things. And as you were saying before, um, for the users, it removes the burden from them completely, right? And it allows them to just use the tooling in flywheel and they can do that. They can have their data uh, in bid compliant format, bids compliant format, from the from the get-go um, and that definitely is kind of the i would say the bridge is kind of a gold standard here for for how you can handle bids compliance from a center perspective um, and i know that your your journey with it was kind of starting from the beginning and and if i may kind of taking a hard line approach 
and just saying to your users, if you're going to put a protocol on the scanner and save it, you're going to do it in repro in, um, and it's going to be curated when it comes into Flywheel. Do you have any kind of advice for, for those centers who are not approaching things that way, or maybe they've been around for a while, um, and how they can, and you did part of this kind of in your presentation, but how they can kind of evangelize this effort uh, for their users and help people get on board? Because I think it's a, it's a very worthwhile goal to try to do this. Um, and a lot of centers may be kind of looking up at this problem um, or maybe not a problem, but up at this goal. Um, do you have any advice for them on how they might kind of go about that? Yeah, we had to, I think, adopt a slightly draconian, narrowly draconian process in order to make this work because of the range of backgrounds and experiences and histories that our different users had. What we do is, you know, there's this very small group of, of people at the center who can set up projects on the console. So that would be okay. myself, the scientific operations director, sometimes the technologists, and they're all trained, we're all trained on this standard and this, this naming logic that we have in the console. And so it's stripped away some control that certain users had on just, you know, trying to, you know, copy a sequence and change a few parameters and then just add that to their queue and do a lot more things on the fly than I think, you know, this allows for people to do because if you're going to make changes, it has to be formally requested, right? We, somebody at the center has to make these changes onto a protocol. Um, and that creates kind of a bottleneck on the setup. Of, of the project. But in the end, what ends up happening is people start to get used to this logic. So it's a learning phase for the center to kind of do. So if you want to adopt this kind of center-wide standard, you have to kind of take a draconian approach at first at access to setting up projects and thinking carefully about the logic of, of your, you know, directory structure and finally make convention on the console. Um, and, you know, you're going to get a lot of pushback from that at first, but then over time, what we've discovered is users are starting to get used to that. So users start to think about it in that way. So we're starting to expand out um, thinking, allowing for, you know, users more access to running the scanner and getting, you know, uh, getting experience setting up their own projects in the console. And now that that's kind of a behavioral pattern and that's a, that's a center-wise habit, what ends up happening is people start thinking just in that way. And so as a result, over time, it's less of a, a conflict and a relearning from the users. And it's more of like an educational process and users just kind of adapt it and move on. So uh, I think taking that kind of a draconian control approach at first is really good. And then using that as like an educational process to have people think, because most people don't really mm -hmm. think about directory structures and final naming convention. Yeah. That's as boring as it gets, right? Um, right? But it's as important as anything else. And so I think, you know, getting people used to thinking about that, it was really just a matter of time and process. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you kind of having the, uh, and the others who, who are involved in the process of setting this up, having that kind of end state in mind um, is incredibly important. Because as you say, typically most users are there, you know, they're a little stressed out. They're trying to capture their data. They just want it to get somewhere where they can analyze it. And they're not necessarily thinking about down the line, right? Um, and that that kind of makes me wonder, have you heard any uh, feedback from your users about kind of how they've been taking advantage of having the data in bids format and what it's kind of meant for them and kind of looked back once it's in file and said, aha, actually, Tim was on to something. Thank you for doing that kind of thing. Uh, anything like that? I would say that um, the the positive view of this, of this bids compliant process is inversely proportional to time spent experience doing neuroimaging research. So, you know, if you've got a, a pipeline you've been using for 20 years, a lot of labs actually just kind of work around it. Like, cause you automate, you also get the DICOMs as well. That's one of the things that I like is, you know, you're going to get your bids compliant data, but your other source data is, is still there. So you have still the DICOMs. So a lot of, we've got some groups who just take their own DICOM conversion routines, go from that DICOM and, and can plug it in and play. And then they end up having to come back and say, okay, I need to, I need to share the data. So oh, there's the bids you know, there's the bits data. I'll just scrape yeah. the bits data for pushing up to open neuro. Um, and that seems to be one way that people have adopted. The users who are, are kind of early in their training, particularly graduate students and postdocs who are, you know, the main workhorse of collecting data, um, they mm -hmm. tend to, we see a lot more enthusiasm for this, this kind of uh, support. So uh, the, I see a lot more students who are thinking in terms of bids apps and bid standardization. Yeah. Um, thinking about how to analyze, how to kind of take advantage of using fMRI prep or QSI prep as, as part of their initial, you know, steps of getting their data. 
uh, there seems to be a lot more enthusiasm because a lot of the headaches that were involved before are now no longer there. So it's, it's a very easy mm -hmm. step for them, right? Um, you can get your fMRI prepped data in bids compliant format, nice and clean, um, directly at the imaging center, which is something that, you know, previous generations would have to spend weeks fighting and setting up and then, sure. find, you know, waste a desktop for 24 hours a day per subject doing the fMRI prep right now that just happens somewhere else and you eventually just get your data. So it's much easier. And so as a result of that ease of the kind of next generation of students working with this data, they're, they're very pleasantly surprised or happy adopting this, this format. Fantastic. Well, that's great, Tim. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, really appreciate you sharing your experience there. Um, hopefully that helps folks you know, watching this video uh, understand the benefits uh, of using a system like Flywheel uh, and the bids and, and standardizing this stuff at the console. Um, and Bridge is definitely, a, a, like I was saying, a gold standard on how to approach that, and how to accomplish that. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time uh, and we appreciate you for it. All right. Thank you for having me.